ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So welcome once again to our Wednesday Bhagavad Gita class. In our Wednesday classes, we have covered three important shlokas so far: Sarva Dharman Parityajya. Then we did Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, and last time we did Mattaha Parataram Nanyat. And this time we will do a very important and a very basic verse of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter two. Verse number thirteen. So, those of you who have your copies of Bhagavad Gita, kindly open up to this verse. Kindly repeat after me. Dehinos minyatha dehe, kaumaram yovanam yara, tatha dehantara prapte. Diyas tatra namuyati Dehinos minyatha dehe Kaumaram yavanam jara Tatha dehantara prapti Diyas tatra namuyati Dehinos minyatha dehe Kaumaram yavanam jara Tatha dehantara prapti Dheeras tatra namuyati So I will now read the word for word meanings Dehinaha of the embodied Asmin in this Yatha as Dehe in the body Kaumaram boyhood Yovanam youth Jara old age Tatha, similarly, Dehantara, transference of the body, Praptihi, achievement, Dhiraha, the sober, Tatra, thereupon, Na, never, Mohiyati, Deluded. Translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Kindly repeat after me. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. The self-realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. I will now read the purport or the commentary that is given by Srila Prabhupada. So I read, quote, Since every living entity is an individual soul, each is changing his body every moment manifesting sometimes as a child, sometimes as a youth, sometimes as an old man. Yet the same spirit soul is there and does not undergo any change. This individual soul finally changes the body at death and transmigrates to another body. And since it is sure to have another body in the next birth, either material or spiritual, there was no cause for lamentation by Arjuna on account of death. 
neither for Bhishma nor for Drona, for whom he was so much concerned. Rather, he should rejoice for their changing bodies from old to new ones, thereby rejuvenating their energy. Such changes of body account for varieties of enjoyment or suffering according to one's work in life. So Bhishma and Drona, being noble souls, were surely going to have either spiritual bodies in the next life or at least in heavenly bodies for superior enjoyment of material existence. So in either case there was no cause for lamentation. Any man who has perfect knowledge of the constitution of the individual soul, the super soul and nature, both material and spiritual, is called a dhira or a most sober man. Such a man is never deluded by the change of bodies. The Mayavadi theory of oneness of the spirit soul cannot be entertained on the ground that the spirit soul cannot be cut into pieces as a fragmental for portion. Such cutting into different individual souls would make the supreme cleavable or changeable against the principle of the supreme soul being unchangeable. As confirmed in the Gita, the fragmental portions of the supreme exist eternally, sanatana, and are called kshara. That is, they have a tendency to fall down into material nature. These fragmental portions are eternally so, and even after liberation, the individual soul remains the same, fragmental. But once liberated, he lives an eternal life in bliss and knowledge with the personality of Godhead. The theory of reflection can be applied to the super soul who is present in each and every individual body and is known as the Paramatma, who is different from the individual living entity. When the sky is reflected in water, the reflections represent both the sun and the moon and the stars also. The stars can be compared to the living entities and the sun or the moon to the Supreme Lord. The individual fragmental spirit soul is represented by Arjuna and the Supreme Soul is the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. They are not on the same level as it will be apparent in the beginning of the fourth chapter. If Arjuna is on the same level with Krishna and Krishna is not superior to Arjuna, then the relationship of instructor and instructed becomes meaningless. If both of them are deluded by the illusory energy, Maya, then there is no need of one being the instructor and the other the instructed. Such instruction would be useless because in the clutches of Maya, no one can be an authoritative instructor. Under the circumstances, it is admitted that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord, superior in position to the living entity, Arjuna, who is a forgotten soul deluded by Maya. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yana Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kata Mahiyam Dadhati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitam Vansha Kalpatarubhya Shikrapa Sindhu Bhyavacha Patitana Pavanibhya Vaishnavibhya Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this is one of the most basic verses that we find in the Bhagavad Gita. And that is why it is one of the most important. Generally when we embark on the spiritual path and we begin studying Bhagavad Gita and as we begin to acquire more and more spiritual knowledge and our understanding becomes better and more firm and clear, we tend to think that these simpler concepts of the basic teachings of Bhagavad Gita are now not for me. Now I have gone a little beyond and therefore I need not study or remind myself of these basic verses. But factually, the more we are in spiritual life, 
the more we need to remind ourselves every day of basic teachings such as the teaching given in this shloka. So we should not think that I already know this shloka, I already know the meaning of this shloka and therefore it is not important for me. Even at the topmost level every day we must remind ourselves that I am not this body, I am the soul. This has to go on. Because spiritual life is not simply a matter of theoretical understanding. It is actually a matter of experience. And the power of Maya, the deluding energy of the Lord is so powerful that we can get misdirected at any moment of time. So therefore we have to constantly remind ourselves of the basic teachings every day. And of course side by side we have to make spiritual progress. So in this shloka Lord Krishna is teaching us the A, B, C, D of spiritual knowledge. The very beginning. And I would also like to dwell on this subject a little in detail at this time because there are many people who are coming probably for the first time or who have come to the temple very recently. So I will deal with this subject from a very basic viewpoint so that our understanding is clear. And also for those devotees who have been coming for some time, it is necessary that we should have not just an idea of what the shloka means, but we should be able to present this understanding to other people. Because this is the mission of Lord Krishna. This is the mission of Lord Chaitanya. It is a preaching mission. It is not just a mission where we are going to uplift ourselves. This is a mission where whatever little we have learnt, we try to share with others. And unless you are able to present what you have learnt very cogently, in a very articulate and systematic fashion, it will not become so useful for the others. So therefore we have to also study from the point of view of trying to impart this knowledge to others. Lord Krishna explains in the 18th chapter that such a devotee who is always trying to uplift the others, not from a superior position, but in the position of being his servant, such a position, such a person, Lord Krishna says, is very dear to me. And there is no servant in the world who is more dear to me than such a devotee. So let us approach this shloka from this understanding. Now the first thing that Lord Krishna teaches us here in the shloka is that we are the soul, we are not this body. The whole world is laboring under the illusion that we are this material body. But all it requires is a little bit of thought and we will be able to appreciate that in fact we are something that is quite different from this material body. So the whole world is laboring under the illusion that we are this material body. But even a little bit of thought will make us understand that actually we are different from this body. We all have the experience that a dead body has something missing. Perhaps somebody in your family has expired. You may have been to the cremation of some other loved one or maybe a relative or a friend. And you have experienced that this body is not able to do what it was able to do earlier. So what is the difference? What is the difference between that dead body and that person who was alive just a few minutes ago? What is the difference between you and me and this platform over here? The difference obviously is that we are alive and this platform is not alive. This floor is not alive. But when we say that we are not, this thing is not alive, what do we mean? We mean that he has no symptom of consciousness. He has no symptoms of life. And the symptom of life is consciousness, chetana. So unless the symptom of life or the consciousness is present within a living entity or within a particular body, the body of the person will never become alive. He will be dead. So the difference between a dead body and a living body is that a living body is said to be alive because there is consciousness within. What is the meaning of consciousness? Can anyone answer? What is the meaning of consciousness? If it can be an interactive session, it will be nice. You need not fear that what you say may be wrong. Yes? The divinity within us, yes. But at a slightly more basic level? Yes. The power to feel something and to know something, that is also very correct. The active principle, it's a little difficult to understand that term, but yes, you are right. Correct. So all the answers are right, but the basic one I'm looking for is the ability to be aware, the ability to experience, the ability to know, 
the ability to feel and perceive, these are all the symptoms of consciousness. And therefore we say that I am alive and I am conscious. There was a famous French philosopher called Descartes. He said, I think, therefore I am. So the fact that we are thinking, feeling, willing, talking, sleeping, waking up, these are all symptoms, they indicate that we are all alive and there is consciousness present within the body. So the next question is, where is this consciousness coming from? What is the origin or what is the source of this consciousness? Yes, anyone? But you have to convince me now. Now you have to convince me that the soul, yes, somebody is saying soul. So you have to convince me that the soul is the source of this consciousness. So what are the arguments you will use to actually say that... Yes? Yes. Very correct. But suppose, let me play the devil's advocate. But you see, the problem is, some matter is dead, but according to me, there is some matter that is alive. That is why you are alive. All the chemicals in my body, they are reacting in such a way, they are producing the life symptoms. Scientists, they are producing all these DNAs and RNAs in the laboratory. So, the chemicals within me, they are the source of the consciousness. Because of reactions of chemicals, we have the symptom being formed. Well, you see, let us talk about the present time. My source of chemicals, I have come from my parents. So my parents have given me birth and therefore I have all the bodies and the chemicals within me. And therefore the chemicals are responsible. They are responsible for all the life functions. I can see that when I am ill, I go to a doctor, he gives me some chemicals and I become alright. Yes, but you see, I, I, I don't know about Krishna. I, it's a little far-fetched for me to believe what is this Krishna, who is Krishna. Somehow I cannot have faith, who is Krishna. So can you tell me something that I can relate to now in my experience? Yes. <clears throat> the example is the correct one. You see, all the chemicals are there in the dead body also. And they are there in the person who is alive. So what is it that is missing? If consciousness is coming from the chemicals, the chemicals are present even in the dead body. And when the person dies, he dies in a matter of a moment. One moment he is there, the next moment he is not there. And then all the relatives, they mourn and they lament and they say, Oh, he has gone, he has gone. But where has he gone? He is still there. All the chemicals, the hormones, the enzymes, the bones, the blood, everything is still there. So where has he gone? Who has gone? That something who is responsible for the consciousness has gone. We can understand intuitively that we say, my hand, my body, my head, my leg, indicating that these things belong to somebody. Just like I say, this is my book. It means that the book is separate from me. And it belongs to me. I am something, the book is something different, and the book belongs to me. So when I say my hand, that means my hand is separate, I am separate, and the hand belongs to me. Similarly, I say my body. So that means my body is different, I am different, and my body belongs to me. We never say I hand is injured, uh, I stomach is feeling hungry. Do we say I mind is confused? So we say my, even intuitively we can understand that these things belong to somebody. And that somebody is different from all these other organs and even the body as a whole. And what to speak of chemicals, somebody made an analysis and he published a paper that if you collect all the chemicals from the body, the hydrochloric acid in the body and all the different varieties of enzymes and so on, and you sell them in the market at the market price, all these chemicals are not worth together more than a few hundred rupees. Of course, nobody will buy your flesh and nobody will buy your blood. Blood, yes, you can donate something. 
but nobody will buy your decaying flesh and the blood and the bones. So what is the value of this body? The value of this body is only worth a few hundred rupees. But just see, a person who has a kidney problem, he is willing to pay lakhs of rupees to get one kidney donor. It has become such a racket. You must be aware of this. Organ transplants and organ donors, it has become a big racket today. So a person is willing to pay lakhs of rupees to get one kidney. Although his his body is not worth more than a few hundred rupees. What to speak of a kidney, even if his little finger is dislocated from the body, he is willing to pay so many thousands and thousands of rupees to get the finger affixed once again. So just see, if a tiny portion of our body is separated from us, we are willing to pay so much. But the body together is not worth, in a, worth more than a few hundred rupees. If a finger is lying by itself, it has no value. But when you fix it to the body, it has value. Similarly, the body itself, when the consciousness is there, it has some value. When the consciousness leaves the body, everyone throws it into the fire. Nobody will keep it in the house for more than two days. Correct? It's no good. So what is it that is giving this body that is actually worth more, just no more than a few hundred rupees, what is it that gives it some value? What is it that makes your body so dear to you that you are willing to give up your life to protect it? We are all willing to give up our life to simply protect this body. So what is it that is making your life, your body so valuable? That is something that is within this body, that is different from the body. That is the source of this consciousness. A further proof is given by Lord Krishna in this verse. In this verse, Dehinosman Yathadehe, Lord Krishna is explaining that right from childhood to youth to boyhood to old age, the body is changing all the time. It is growing. We all have experience of this. You know that when you were a small boy or a small girl, and then you, after a couple of years when some relatives saw you, they say, Oh, you have grown so big. Uh, then you say, they don't recognize you. But you are always aware of you that you are yourself. You are not in any identity crisis, are you? They may not recognize you on the street, but you don't forget yourself. You appreciate, yes, my height has changed, my weight has changed, my mind has changed, my intelligence has changed. Everything about me has changed, but I am the same. I am Mr. So-and-so. I am I. That sense of I-ness, that sense of identity, that sense of consciousness, that is the same. That has not changed. You still think you are you. You only say that this different aspects or attributes in relation to you have changed. But you are the same. It's just like saying, I had earlier 50 rupees in the bank, now I have 100 rupees in the bank, tomorrow I will have 200 rupees in the bank. Your money balance is changing, but you are the same. Similarly, the various attributes that are related to you, they are changing, but you are the same. I am I. So your body is changing. Medical science tells us that every second, there are cells in your body that are dying, there are cells in your body that are being born. And this is going on and on. And what is the meaning of old age? Old age means that the cells are decaying faster than they are being born. Am I right? Medical people here? Correct? Old age means that the cells are decaying faster than they are being born. So it is only a question of whether the cells are being born more, more in number or whether the souls that are decaying are more in number. But all the time there is change. And medical science tells us that in seven years, there is a complete overhauling of your entire body. All the tissues, all the cells, all the chemicals are completely changed. There is not a single cell or a tissue within you that was there in your body seven years ago. Nothing. You are completely in a different body. So you are changing bodies in this life. It is going on. So Lord Krishna says, just as you are changing bodies even in this life, naturally it is understood that you are changing bodies even in the next, when you give up this body, you have to accept another body. So Lord Krishna is saying here, that that sense of identity which remains permanent, all through this change of bodies, is that Atma. Because that sense of i doesn't change, although everything else is changing, it means that that sense of i is something different from and superior to all the changes of the body. 
So it must be something distinct. It must be something separate from the body and superior to the body. And that is the soul. That is the Atma. So you see, we can derive the understanding of the soul from so many logical points. We should not think Bhagavad Gita is simply some sentimental, emotional kind of religious mumbo-jumbo. It is based on very strong scientific spiritual foundation. So the soul is within this body. It is located in the region of the heart. And although it is physically located at one point, it is spreading its symptom all over the body. In the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes that just like the sun, though it is located at physically one place in the solar system, but it spreads its sunshine everywhere, all through the solar system. Similarly, the soul is located at one point in the heart within the body, but it is spreading its energy all throughout the body, from the tip of the toe to the tip of your fingers to the top of your head. Every region, if you pinch, if you are pinched at any one of these points, you will feel the sensation. That is because that consciousness is present. So consciousness is a present of, is a, is a symptom of the soul. And the soul is life. As you rightly said earlier on, right in the beginning, that matter is dead. It is always dead. And the soul is life. Matter is never alive. So, the soul is present through the medium of the, the consciousness is present through the medium of the soul. Now, you cannot see the sunlight outside. But just about three hours back, if you were sitting here, you would have seen light outside. You cannot see the sun at that situation, but you can understand that the sun is present. Why? Because you see the sunshine. From the sunshine, you can infer that the sun is present. Because the sunshine is the energy, the symptom of the sun. So although you cannot directly see the sun, you still infer that the sun is present. Just because you cannot see the sun, it doesn't mean that the sun doesn't exist. Do you and I ask for proof that the sun is existing? Similarly, what is the proof that the soul exists? The proof is consciousness. Consciousness is the symptom. The very fact that you are listening here to me, I am speaking, you are thinking, feeling, willing, acting, it all means that there is consciousness and therefore there is the Atma within. The dead body, it does not have consciousness because the soul has left the body. Therefore, the body is said to be dead. So what is death? Death is nothing but the departure of the soul from the body. When the soul leaves the body permanently, that is called death. And at the time of conception, that is called birth. The soul re-enters the mother's womb at the time of conception and that is the time when the soul re-enters the body once again. And then the body grows into the fetus in the mother's womb and so on. These things are described in great detail by Lord Kapila in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It is described with the Jeevatma. He leaves the body at the time of death. When this body becomes unsuitable, he leaves this body. And then according to his karma, karmana daivanetrena, he is forced to accept another body. And if by his karma he is to get a human body, then he is made to accept the semen of a man who will impregnate a woman. And then he occupies the womb of the mother. And in this way, inside, once inside the womb of the mother, the, by the process, the biological process, the womb, the fetus will grow and grow and grow. So people today are unaware of this fact. So they are speculating. Somebody thinks the uh, fetus comes to life at the age of three months. Somebody says the child is born at the age of two months. So they say it is all right to do abortion uh, before so and so number of months. It is okay, you can do that. And the Supreme Courts are passing orders and so many people are passing rules and regulations without having the least idea of when this is going on. Even the doctors have no idea of the process of the soul leaving the body and the soul accepting another body. But still, they are taking on a position of authority and of knowledge and are passing judgment. And therefore, they are simply cheating the people at large. There were famous controversies in America. The Supreme Court, it passed judgments that abortion is legal provided it is done beyond a certain point in time, which they specified. But the interesting point is that the Supreme Courts, they had overturned the previous verdicts. Earlier on, they said, no, no, it is all right to do abortion beyond this stage. But later on, they revised their opinion and said, no, no, now you must do it after this stage, not at this stage. 
In other words, what they are saying is that according to the kind of opinion or judgment we are making, the fetus within the womb must follow that instruction and must come to life at that time. Isn't it? See, even if the soul, take, even if the fetus is taking life at a particular point in time within the womb, that is going to take place according to nature's course. By passing some judgment in the Supreme Court, you cannot dictate that the soul should be trans, the fetus should come to life at a particular point in time. So therefore, the greatest cruelty is being done. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is being described that as Kali Yuga progresses, mothers will, mothers and fathers will procreate and have children just for the sake of eating. Just for the sake of eating, man and woman will bear a child because there will be so much of food shortage. But nowadays we are seeing that we are not very far from that. Because mothers, because the mothers and fathers, they simply want to enjoy sex life without having the responsibility for bearing the child. Sex life is actually meant for procreation. Dharma viruddha bhuteshu kamosmi bharatarshabha. This is what Lord Krishna says in the Gita. But today the culture is so permissive that people simply want to enjoy their senses and they don't want to bear the consequences of that in terms of the responsibility and the struggle that is involved in bringing up a child. So they will simply get themselves aborted and take the easy way out. But they do not realize the tremendous bad karma that they are entailing for themselves and the whole world. It is said that one who actually does abortion is going to be himself or herself aborted in the womb in the next life. So in this way there is so much cruelty going on in the name of sense enjoyment. And all this is simply because of ignorance. We are not aware that right from the point of conception the soul is present within the body. Right from the beginning. There is no need for any mental concoction in this regard. That whether is it two months, is it three months, is it four months. All over the railway trains when you go in the compartments, you find advertisements splashed all over abortion, rupees 70, rupees 90. It is so disgusting. Life has become valueless. People have no value for life now. Simply because it is a small child within the womb, it is harmless. You cannot understand its life symptoms, although they are there. Any mother will tell you that they understand the child is present within the womb right from the beginning. But still, we want to cover ourselves with illusion. We do not want to think about these things. We want to live a very convenient life of sense enjoyment without having to pay the price of that bad karma. So that is why all this sinful life is going on. And the troubles in the world today are because of sin committed on the basis of ignorance. So therefore this shloka is very important for people in the world to understand. Then they will not commit sinful reactions. Even in the medical colleges, some of our devotees are medical students. And one of our devotees was doing MD gynecology. And she refused to do abortions. She said, according to my religious convictions, I cannot do abortions. So initially there was a lot of... ...beyond a certain point. Every gynecologist is practically making his living out of these abortions. Am I right? Most of his income is coming from his abortion. And everyone wants to turn a blind eye to it. Simply because everyone is, wants to just be, is in ignorance. So this is, this knowledge is what is required in the world today. So the soul is the symptom of consciousness. Simply because that consciousness is temporarily covered over within the womb. It does not mean that this child or the person is not alive. Just like sometimes the sun is hiding behind the clouds during the monsoon. But it doesn't mean that the sun is not there. An intelligent person understands that the sun is there. Although its effect is a little muted. Similarly, sometimes the consciousness is a little covered over. It is not allowed to manifest in its fullest extent. Therefore, some ignorant people think, oh, it is dead. Hmm? When you are operating in the operation theater, sometimes the patient is in deep coma. Does it mean he's dead? There are some symptoms. So similarly, we should understand that death means when the soul leaves the body and at the time of conception, the soul enters the body. So in this way, by all these different logical points, we can understand that actually the soul is present. So the soul cannot be understood and seen by our microscopes and our telescopes and our different instruments. The soul has to be understood at a preliminary level in the way that we have discussed just now. At the intellectual level. At the logical level. Although you cannot understand spiritual truth and God only by logic, still logic and intelligence is a useful stepping stone. 
because your mind has to be convinced. So we have to go through this whole rigmarole of trying to understand the logical basis of spiritual life. So that our faith and conviction can become very strong. So therefore, when once our understanding is very clear on a logical basis, then once we start practicing spiritual life, then this theoretical understanding is transformed into experience. And that experience, when you experience that you are the soul, then there is no further proof for all this argumentation and all this discussion and do's and don'ts and all these other things. You are experiencing the soul. You have understood you are not the body. This is the condition of a person who is on Brahma Bhuta platform or a self-realized platform. Such a person is called a dhira. As Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport, here a dhira means one who has perfect knowledge of the constitution of the individual soul, the super soul and of nature, material and spiritual. So a person who is in knowledge, theoretical and experienced, such a person is called a dhira. So such a dhira, he doesn't lament when a person dies because he understands that the soul has left the body, the soul is eternal. The soul is not subject to destruction. Lord Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, Najayate miryate va kadachin nayam bhutva bhavita vana bhuya ajo nityo shashvato yam purano nahanyate hanyamane sharire. He says, For the soul there is never birth nor death, nor having once been does he ever cease to be. The soul is eternal, and when the body is destroyed, the soul is not destroyed. So in this way, Lord Krishna is describing the various properties of the soul. He goes on to say, Nainam chindanti shastrani, Nainam dahati pavakaha. Na chainam kledayantyapo na shoshati marutaha. He says you can't cut the soul by any knife. You can't burn it by fire. You can't moisten it by water. You cannot dry it by the wind. The soul is insoluble, unbreakable. You cannot crush it in any grinder. You cannot subject the soul to any kind of material transformation. The soul is always transcendental. It is spiritual. It is beyond the material sphere. This is the property of the soul. Sat Chit Ananda. Sat means it is eternal. Chit means it is full of uh, knowledge and Ananda means it is full of bliss. The body is exactly the opposite. It is temporary, it is full of distress and it is full of ignorance. This is the, con- this is the condition. But unfortunately due to ignorance, we are in a highly incompatible situation now. What is that incompatible situation? The eternal blissful soul in the temporary miserable ignorant body. That is the contradiction. Hmm? That is a paradox. We are eternal, but we are in this temporary body. And what is Maya? Maya means when the temporary eternal, when the eternal soul identifies itself with this temporary material body. That is called Maya. That which is not. We are not this body. But we think we are this body and that is called Maya. The body is like a car and the soul is like a driver. The car exists, the driver exists, both are real. But the car, the driver cannot say, I am the car. Similarly, the soul exists eternally, the body exists temporarily. But the soul is not the body. This is proper understanding. This is knowledge. This is the A, B, C, D of spiritual knowledge. Unless we know this, there is no question of going further ahead in Bhagavad Gita or in any other subject of spiritual knowledge. So therefore we should know that all ignorance and all problems arise simply when this transcendental spiritual living entity confuses himself and identifies himself with his body. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it is said, Yaya Sammohito Jiva Trigunatmakam He says that when the Samoha, when the jiva is under illusion, it comes under the influence of trigunatmakam. Trigunatmakam means the material energy of the three modes of material nature. Due to illusion, the soul gets bewildered. And he starts thinking, I am this body. Although he is something different from this matter, but he thinks, I am this matter. And that is illusion. And therefore he starts identifying himself with all the relationships in connection with his body. So he says, this is my body, this is my friend, this is my father, this is my son, this is my wife, this is my husband, this is my money, this is my this, this is my that. And all the illusions in this way, they get multiplied more and more and more. And the more we expand this illusion, 
the more we get into deeper and deeper into ignorance and suffering. Because suffering is caused by ignorance. There is a very wonderful story in the Srimad Bhagavatam of King Chitra Ketu. This is a story that goes back many, many, many thousands of years ago. So King Chitra Ketu was ruling the, ruling the whole kingdom. Perhaps some of you have heard this story before. And he was a very powerful king, very much loved by his subjects. And he was a very just ruler. He ruled according to the principles of dharma, according to the Vedic system. But he had only one problem in life. And that is that he had no son, no putra. So he was very much distressed and unhappy because of this. One day the great sage Angira Muni, he came to the palace. And he saw that the king was very much in grief. And he approached the king and he told him, My dear king, what is the difficulty? Are you not able to rule the government properly? Are your subjects not happy? Are the provincial governors not paying you your taxes in time? What is the matter? Are your ministers not cooperating with you? So in this way, Angira Muni was inquiring. After the formal courtesies were over, then the king Chitraketu said, My lord, you you know everything. You are a great sage. So you are aware of everything. But yet, nevertheless, because you are asking me, let me confess to you that my grief, my problem is that I have no son. And if I have no son, then who is going to deliver me and my forefathers? You see, in Sanskrit, the word son means putra. There is a particular hellish planet called Pu. And Tra means triety to deliver from. So putra means one who can deliver the parents from the hellish conditions of life. Sometimes, because of indulging in sinful activities, it may happen that the parents and the forefathers, they may have to, by their bad karma, take birth in the hellish planets. So, the true duty of a son or a putra is to, by his performance of virtuous activities, deliver them from the hellish planets. And that is done by certain sacrifices, certain karmakanda sacrifices called pinda, shraddha, pinda and so on. So, you know that after the parent uh, is, the father dies, Usually the son will go to Gaya or to Kashi and they will do some Pinda, Pindadan. So what is the purpose of the Pinda? The Pinda is meant for delivering the soul of the forefathers, of the father and the uh, ancestors. In case they are somewhere caught up or entrapped in some hellish planet. So you see, uh, what is this is still at a material platform. But even the material laws are op- operating at a very subtle level also. We cannot understand how by offering Pinda here, the soul in some body in some other planet is getting the benefit. But that is how this uh, science is very subtle. It has effect even at the subtle material level. So therefore, a putra is necessary to deliver the father and the forefathers. And King Chitra Ketu is very much interested in that. But incidentally, I may point out that once a person becomes a devotee, then there is no need for him to actually, strictly speaking, do all these sacrifices. Because, simply because he is a devotee of the Supreme Lord, automatically he has fulfilled all the injunctions of the scriptures. Because he is watering the root of the tree, there is no need for him to separately water the roots, the, the twigs and the flowers and the fruits. So for a person who has surrendered to the Supreme Lord, there is no need for him to offer pinda. But the very fact that he has become a devotee, he actually rises beyond this. But devotees may sometimes do this for the sake of setting an example in society. If a person is not a devotee, at least he should do these things so that he at least is regulating his life according to scriptural injunctions. So King Chitra Ketu was like that. So he was saying, I need a putra. So King Chitra Ketu, Angira Muni understood that King Chitra Ketu was not in a position to listen to transcendental understanding. Now, you see, if you are destined by your karma not to have a son, what is the use of struggling against your karma? It is best to simply accept this as your destiny, to accept this as providence, as the will of God, and be happy in that. But Angira Muni understood that King Chitra Ketu was in no frame of mind to listen to all this kind of advice. So he said, All right, Tathastu, so be it. I will perform a particular yajna, and your eldest queen, she can partake of the prasad of that, and then she will have a child in due course. But mind you, Angira Muni said, this child will be Harsha Shoka. Harsha means the cause of jubilation and Shoka means the cause of sorrow and grief. So King Chitraketu, he took the prasad and then he was thinking, what is the meaning of what he said, Angira Muni? He said this child will be Harsha Shoka. He will be a cause of jubilation and grief. 
So he said, yes, jubilation because naturally when the son is born in the house, we are all very happy. But then why did he say that he is also going to be a source of grief? Then he started reasoning. He said, well, you see, these days, of course that was true even in those days, what to speak of now. These days, all sons when they grow up, they disobey their father. They don't accept the authority of the father. Huh? So what we are seeing today is nothing new. It's the <laughs> In the material world, these things have been going on eternally. So he was very thinking maybe because he will disobey us and he will not do many things that I ask him to do. But still, you see, better have a son, a disobedient son than no son at all. So he was satisfied. But actually, Chanakya Pandit, in his Niti, Chanakya Niti explains that unless a son is a devotee of the Lord or he's a learned scholar, such a son is no more than it's simply a disease in the family. He's like a diseased eye. He's not worth having such a son. But then a materialistic person, at that time King Chitraketu was an illusion. Of course, as we will see later on in Srimad Bhagavatam, he went on to become a very exalted devotee. But at this point of time, he was simply covered over by ignorance. So, such a person doesn't care whether he's, he, requires, he has a good son or a bad son. So he said, nevertheless, let me have a son. So then, in due course of time, his eldest queen gave birth to a son. And then the king was overjoyed, the queen was overjoyed, the whole kingdom was overjoyed. There was intensive celebration going on all over the kingdom. And it is described just as when a poor man gets hold of some money. Because he's been starved of money all his life, and now he's exposed to money, therefore every day the more money he gets, the more his intoxication and attachment to the money increases day by day. Similarly, because Lord King Chitraketu had been uh, deprived of a son, now that he had the son, as the days passed, his attachment to his son went on increasing more and more and more, and he became mad in his attachment to his son. He was doting on his son to the extent that he forgot his royal duties as the king. And one day, as you know, this happens when your attentions get focused on one person, you tend to neglect the others, then the others start feeling bad. So the other queens of King Chitraketu started feeling envious because now King Chitraketu was spending most of his time only with that queen who was the mother of that child. So they became so envious, it was burning in their heart like a very strong fire. So they could not tolerate that envy anymore. So they decided we must now kill this child because he is the cause of our suffering. He has made us in this position now. We are in a position that is worse than the maidservants in the house. The king does not even talk to us now. This child is responsible. So one day, very quietly, when everyone was sleeping, they poisoned the child. And the child died. And when the queen found out, she was besides herself with grief, and she immediately collapsed in unconsciousness. The king at that time was in his darbar. And when he heard, he also became insane with grief. And immediately, he started jumping and running towards the inner chambers of his palace. And as he ran, his his helmet, his crown came off, his hair was disheveled, his clothes were disorganized, he started crying, he slipped and he fell, again he was picking himself up and he was slipping and falling. In this way, somehow or the other, blinded by the tears that were shooting from his eyes, he was running towards the inner chambers and when he came there, he fell unconscious. He used to wake up, again see that the sun is dead, again fall unconscious. In this way, both the king and queen were simply immersed in an ocean of grief that only a mother and father who have longed for a child and then who have subsequently lost it after a short while, such a sorrow that only such mother and father can experience. So being in that situation, he was lying like a dead body as if he was dead along near the child. And just at that time, Angira Muni happened to come. He understood what was going on. And this time he brought along Narad Muni, the great sage Narada. So when they came, they started telling King Chitraketu, my dear king, This does not become of you. You are the king of the whole land. What is this? Just look at your condition. This does not become of you. What is the problem? So naturally King Chitraketu just said, Please bring my son back to life. Whatever you can, please do it. So Angira Muni said, I warned you that it would be Harsha Shoka. You wanted the Harsha. But in this world, if you want happiness, you have to be prepared for sorrow. You can't have only one. You have to have both. So I told you, Harsha Shoka. But he said, no, 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 you please bring me back my son. And then the instructions of Angira Muni, they are very, very instructive. So I would like to read 
some shlokas from the Srimad Bhagavatam which give us the teachings of Angira Muni to King Chitra Ketu. Very instructive. So let us listen very, very carefully. While King Chitra Ketu, overcome by lamentation, lay like a dead body at the side of the dead body of his son, the two great sages Narada and Angira instructed him about spiritual consciousness as follows. O king, what relationship does the dead body for which you lament have with you? And what relationship do you have with him? You may say that you are now related as father and son, but do you think that this relationship existed before? Does it truly exist now? Will it continue in the future? O king, as small particles of sand sometimes come together and are sometimes separated due to the force of the waves, the living entities who have accepted material bodies sometimes come together and are sometimes separated by the force of time. Just like you see in the river or on the sea beach, if you are sitting on the sea beach, you will see by the force of the waves, certain particles come together by the force of the waves. And when the waves recede, then all the particles are dispersed and they never meet again. And then when the wave comes back, it will bring together another group of sand particles. Again, these particles will be dispersed and this goes on and on. A di- different groups of particles come together for a short while and then they are dispersed. So, Angira Muni is saying that just like that, a group of jivatmas is brought together in a particular arrangement as friends or as enemies, as family members, as countrymen, as society men and so on and so forth. And then, by the force of karma and kala and time, they are all dispersed, never to meet again. So he goes on, When seeds are sown in the ground, they sometimes grow into plants and sometimes do not. Sometimes the ground is not fertile and the sowing of seeds is unproductive. Sometimes the prospective father, being impelled by the potency of the Supreme Lord, can beget a child, but sometimes conception does not take place. Therefore, one should not lament over the artificial relationship of parenthood, which is ultimately controlled by the Supreme Lord. O King, both you and us, your advisors, wives and ministers, as well as everything moving and not moving, throughout the entire cosmos at this time, are in a temporary situation. Before our birth, this situation did not exist. And after our death, it will exist no longer. Therefore, our situation is temporary, although it is not false. Divisions of generalization and specification, that means when you start thinking, this is my body, this is my family, this is my community, this is my country, this is my society. All these divisions, such as nationality, individuality, are the imaginations of persons who are not advanced in knowledge. Thus, enlightened by the instructions of Narada and Angira, King Chitra Ketu became hopeful with knowledge. Wiping his shriveled face with his hand, the king began to speak. So in this way, after being instructed in transcendental knowledge, King Chitra Ketu was able to understand something. And then Narad Muni, out of his grace, he, by his mystic powers, he made the child come back to life. And the child woke up just like a normal man. And he started speaking. So let us see, it is interesting what the child also says. And he was speaking like a like an adult. So the child speaking now, the child who has been called back into the body of the child, the soul who was called back into the body of the child. He said, According to the results of my fruitive activities, I, the living being, transmigrate from one body to another, Sometimes going to the species of the demigods, sometimes to the species of lower animals, sometimes among the vegetables, and sometimes to the human species. Therefore, in which birth were these my mother and father? No one is actually my mother and father. How can I accept these two as my parents? In the material world, which advances like a river that carries away the living entity, all people become friends, relatives and enemies in due course of time. They also act neutrally, They mediate, they despise one another, and they act in so many other relationships. Nonetheless, despite these various transactions, no one is permanently related in this world. Just as gold and other commodities are continuously transferred from one place to another in due course of purchase and sale, 
so also the living entity as a result of fruitive activities wanders throughout the entire universe being injected into various different species of life by one kind of father after another. A few living beings are born in the human species and other are born as animals. Although both are living entities, their relationships are impermanent. An animal may remain in the custody of a human being for some time and then the same animal may be transferred to the possession of another human being. As soon as the animal goes away, the former proprietor no longer has a sense of ownership. As long as the animal is in his possession, he certainly has an affinity for it. But as soon as the animal is sold, the affinity is lost. So just like you own a dog, the dog is sold to somebody else, the cow is sold to somebody else, so you lose the attachment. So also you have this body, and then the body goes, you lose the attachment for that body. Or even though one living entity becomes connected with another because of a relationship based on bodies that are perishable, the living entity is actually eternal. Actually it is the body that is born or lost, not the living entity. One should not accept that the living entity takes birth or dies. The living being actually has no relationship with so-called fathers and so-called mothers. As long as he appears as the son of a certain father and mother, as a result of his past fruitive activities, he has a connection with the body given by the father and mother. Thus, he falsely accepts himself as their son and acts very affectionately. After he dies, however, that relationship is finished. Under these circumstances, one should not be falsely involved with jubilation and lamentation. One should be dhira. One should not be simply lamenting and be jubilant at different times. So in this way, so many wonderful instructions are given by this child. So we can understand that this knowledge is very important for us. It is meant for practical application in our daily life. It is not that when you go back home now, you should go back and tell your parents, I have read in Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita that you are not my parents. So therefore now I will not take care of you. Now, no more. You are no more my parents, so I am walking out of this house. Not like that. Because they mean they are not permanent parents. But temporarily in this life, because you are related to them, therefore at a material level you may perform certain obligations. And these obligations and duties may be performed but with the understanding that ultimately these temporary relationships have meaning only within the background of the permanent relationship that the soul has with the Supreme Lord. This is very important to understand. The only eternal relationship that we have is the relationship at the level of the soul. And that relationship is with Lord Krishna. We are eternal parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. Mamai Vamsu Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatanaha. So we are eternally parts and parcels of the Lord and we are servants of the Supreme Lord always. And our eternal function in life is to serve Him and love Him. This is human life. Human life is meant for reawakening ourselves to the understanding of this permanent relationship. So all the temporary relationships of this world may certainly be executed. But without forgetting our real eternal relationship. The two must go hand in hand. We cannot simply just say that I will only take care of my father and mother or my brother and sister and wife and husband and children and I will neglect my permanent relationship. This has this we have been doing life after life for so many lifetimes. But now the time has come. We should revive our lost relationship with the Supreme Lord and make our life perfect. This is the real success of our life. We have forgotten our real father. Lord Krishna says, Sarva Yoni Shukaunteya, Murta Yaha Sambhavantiya, Tasa Mahat Brahma Yoni Mahat Brahma. He says, I am the father of all living entities. Aham Bijaha Pradhapita. Therefore, I am the real seed giving father. I am the father of all. So we have forgotten our real father, our real mother. And now we should revive our lost relationship with our real father and real mother. That is the goal of our life. So I have some couple of pictures to show you. In this we can understand, we are showing, you are seeing here, how in this life the body is changing, but sometimes because it is changing so rapidly, the cells are changing, it is such a gradual change, actually a change that flows into continuous change, we don't understand. Just like in a cinema. 
In a cinema, what happens? A film reel is nothing but a, series, a succession of still films, isn't it? A succession of, of still pictures. When those are run in rapid succession, it gives you the illusion of continuity in a movie. And it appears that the whole thing is moving. Similarly, at every point of time, this material body is changing, but I think I am there in this body. But actually you are changing bodies. But all the while, you are the same. The, the person who is running, he is the same here in this picture. But actually his body is changing. But he doesn't realize. Because the change is so continuous. It is not discrete. And here you are seeing how the soul is transmigrating from childhood to boyhood to youth to old age. And then finally, at old age, the soul leaves the body. And this is called the wheel of sansara. Sometimes you are in a human body, sometimes you get the body of a fish, the body of a plant or another animal and so on. And this wheel of sansara has been going on. And in this human form of life, we have to now give up. Give up this attachment to this particular material body and get out of the wheel of sansara. That is the perfection of human life. Now it is time for the darshan. Uh, we will have question answers after the darshan. I got a little carried away in the discussion of King Chitraketu. I wanted to leave 5-10 minutes for the question answers before. But if you don't mind, if you have 10 minutes, kindly halt after the darshan. We will have question answers. And also, uh, we will revise. Those of you who wish, you can recite the shlokas that we have done at the previous time. Because as you remember, all of you uh, were to do it as homework to remember the shlokas. It is voluntary. But we will have also that for about a couple of minutes after the darshan. So now we will wait for the beautiful darshan of their lordships, Sri Sri Radha Gopinath. Kindly feast your eyes now and immerse your consciousness at their lotus feet. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Anyone has any? Can feel free to ask any questions. Yes. Particularly if it is relevant to today's subject. Please make your questions brief and to the point so that everyone's time is so utilized nicely. It's about uh, you telling about the thing that uh, we are not serving enough about our original father and mother. Uh -huh. So basically the biological father and mother of myself, they were created by God. I was created by God. So in fact if I am serving my biological mother and father, so I am even serving God at the same time. So what's the difference? You see, everything has been created by God. Not just the biological father and mother. Even the stone, the trees, the plants, the air, everything is created by God. So actually, you should love everything. And that indeed is the position of one who is in love of God. God, as I explained, is like the root of the tree. If you water the tree, or root of the tree, automatically the whole tree will be nourished. Similarly, if you love God, automatically you will love everyone. If you serve God, automatically you will begin to serve everybody. If you separately try to serve the different various parts and parcels, then that service is incomplete. So therefore, the best way to really serve your parents is also to become a devotee of God and help them to become devotees of God. So you may be serving your parents, and although your parents are created by God and you are created by God, but if that service to them is devoid of an understanding of your relationship and their relationship to Krishna, the Supreme Lord, then that is simply an illusory relationship. Hmm? So you have to make your temporary relationships in this world meaningful on the basis of your relationship with Krishna and their relationship with Krishna. Everyone is related to Krishna. At the spiritual level, we are all brothers. At the spiritual level. So whatever at the bodily level, physical level, whatever relationships there are, you should keep Krishna in the center of your life, in your family, wherever you are, in the country, in society, and then there can be peace and happiness. So the point in Chitraketu's story was, that all the other relationships are temporary, and they're meaningless because Krishna was not there. But you bring in Krishna, it becomes meaningful. Yes? No, your question is answered? In fact, if some of you want further clarifications, maybe we can meet at a personal level afterwards also, just in case it becomes too late for everyone. As in your all lectures, you say, okay, all this come from the Krishna, like Krishna said. So actually he said or he, he sent through the scriptures. 
because the scripture was written by the humans only actually bhagavad gita is spoken by lord krishna himself the whole message of bhagavad gita was spoken on the battlefield of kurukshetra by lord krishna to arjuna and it was faithfully recorded so you will find when krishna speaks it says shri bhagavan uvacha that shri krishna bhagavan is speaking so it was recorded certainly by other people who were not krishna but also valmi the the vyasadev the author of the mahabharat the author of the vedas the puranas the upanishads is an incarnation of lord krishna himself so the author is not an ordinary person he is an incarnation directly number 1 number 2 even if he is not directly an incarnation but still if he is a very highly empowered personality empowered by god to actually write scripture then that scripture is as good as directly the word of god just like valmiki valmiki was not an incarnation of god but he was empowered by god to do what to write ramayan so similarly there are the saintly persons who may be empowered and they write so many wonderful works so although they are not directly written by god they are actually written by god because god inspires them from within to write so these are not to be considered ordinary or mundane works just like the works of any modern or any mundane poet or novelist these are specifically the words of god himself coming through the medium of his devotees or coming directly by himself and what is the proof of this the proof of this is that this message will help you to uplift yourself spiritually and get out of the cycle of birth and death whereas any material novelist or poet will not help you to do that if you follow his teachings you will not be able to do that and you will see the effect of this even in your life while you are alive what to speak of after death you will experience it in this life that is the ultimate test but there are no changes in the scripture that means that is the meaning of parampara parampara means evam parampara praptam imam rajarshayo viduhu the purity of the parampara is maintained when one simply repeats what one hears in parampara so whatever i have spoken today is not my own concoction if it was simply my own concoction it would have no value but it has some meaning because it, i have heard from my guru who has heard from his guru and ultimately who have heard from krishna so the pure devotees of the lord they adapt the principles of the scriptures to understand modern problems like the section i gave on abortion krishna did not speak about abortion in bhagavad gita but still the pure devotees of the lord who have firm realization and understanding of the scripture of the word of god they are able to see with their x-ray vision they are able to understand the problem in the world from the perspective of spiritual knowledge so therefore we simply repeat what is there in parampara and that is the process then nothing will be lost so we are as fortunate as arjuna arjuna was physically on the battlefield of kurukshetra with krishna and we are also physically present with krishna in the form of his instruction there is no difference between the two we should be convinced of this lord krishna can be present either in his personal form that is called vapu but now that is not possible he was he came 5000 years ago but more importantly he is present in the form of his vani vani means instruction and there is no difference between the two because lord krishna is absolute so because we are associating with his vani his instructions therefore it is as good as associating with lord krishna physically personally so we are as fortunate as arjuna was and we will be very unfortunate if we do not take use of this message that lord krishna has given us hmm? any other questions <coughs> among the ladies anyone <coughs> yes i have a friend who's in the buddhism buddhism and we were both talking about the soul but they feel she feels that there is no soul it's just the energy in the body so i asked her from where does the energy come so she says no we just don't believe in reincarnation or anything like that's just the energy and when you die the energy just goes so how do i convince her that there is soul present well you see when she uses the word like energy immediately you should stop her and say energy comes from a source energetic this light is energy but where is that energy coming from can you spoke speak of light without a bulb can you speak of the sunlight without the sun so when you talk of life being an energy we can automatically infer there is an energetic there is a source of that energy and the soul is that source it is as simple as that 
So Buddhists, actually Buddha did not negate the existence of individuality. Buddha proper, actually he is an incarnation of Lord Krishna. It is stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And there is a particular purpose for which Lord Buddha advented. That was to actually stop all the misuse of the Vedic scriptures by the so-called Brahmanas who were misusing the Vedic scriptures for animal sacrifices and for various forms of exploitation of the so-called lower castes. So to stop all this, therefore Lord Krishna incarnated as Buddha and he said, okay, he advocated Ahinsa. And he said, we don't believe in your Vedas. We don't believe in Upanishads. So it was temporarily meant to stop all these other activities. That was the limited specific purpose of the Buddhist philosophy. So we should not get distracted uh, from the pure, pristine teachings of Bhagavad Gita. We can very clearly understand the energy has to have a source and that source is the soul. You can give it all the logical points that we discussed in today's talk. You can present the whole argument as it is. Yes? Microphone, please. Uh, Nimans in Bangalore and in America, they have said there is uh, karma and reincarnation. So, American Dictionary has recently included karma in that. Uh, dictionary, dictionary, which wasn't there before. There's a book which is going to be published this year, Year of the End. They have collected data of people who remembered the past life. So they correlated the um, cause and effect. So if, because it's metaphysical, you can't prove in that sense. But that is a hypothesis which has been proved. Yes. In fact, personally, I have many, many books in this regard. But I did not want to discuss because we had only... 40, 45 minutes for the talk. In fact, there are many books, and those of you who are seriously interested, these are real life cases of memory of previous lives, even in India. And in India recently, there has been a lady who has done her PhD in this subject from Bangalore, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. So they are going through so much trouble of years and years of research work to understand, and finally, still they are unsure is it true, is it not true? But all we have to do is just read, Dehe no Spinyatha Dehe, and we get all the information that they have been struggling for years and years to understand, and still they are doubtful. So we take the easy way out. We get knowledge directly from the Supreme Source, Lord Krishna, and then there is no more confusion. But yes, slowly, slowly, the West is also beginning to accept the spiritual wisdom. And all these terminologies are coming into the, uh, the fold of their usual language.